to the Forever Classic Podcast, the show seeking enlightenment through video games, films, and other geek culture. I'm Alex McCumbers, and I have our newest member, Joe Simpson, with me. Oh, that's me. It is. And we don't have Zach tonight because he's he's out doing some work. He had a late night shift this evening, so today's episode is just going to be the two of us. If we all lived closer together, we also probably wouldn't be here too because we'd be dog tired from helping Zach move. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> For sure, I would be there doing my part. Now, Joe, we have a lot of just kind of like out there news. Nothing really super substantial to talk about for today's episode, but... It was a slow week. There wasn't really any major game releases aside from Kingdom Hearts 3 releasing. There wasn't any big news pieces. Everything had kind of already come and gone. Uh, And there's nothing really coming out this week that's huge. So it's just kind of like oddities. There's two games coming out this week that I want to highlight. One of which we'll have an interview for real quick before we do anything else. Scaleboy on Nintendo Switch, that little adventure game that we mentioned before. It has great music. It's a really cool, unique art style. We have an interview with all three of the devs. The whole Umaiki Games team was actually on the show. So we'll have that by the time you guys are probably listening to this episode. And that game launches on the 30th. I believe on the same day, there's a game called Mind Seas that is a kind of classic sci-fi Metroidvania that I think might have some potential. I haven't looked at it any further than just seeing a trailer, but it looks really cool. Yeah. So those are two releases to kind of keep an eye out as far as like some indie stuff this week. Definitely. Overall, I've heard pretty good things from you guys about Skullboy. Some some things that will come up i'm guessing in your final reviews but uh still a fun time yeah it's by no means perfect but all of the elements that i'm having frustrations with are the type of things that should be ironed out via patches okay. and it's something that the developers specifically mentioned having a handle on like that's some of the things they're targeting currently all right so i have a lot of faith that that game in particular will iron itself out and be really really stellar that's good to hear that they're aware of and directly addressing things as they come up come to think of it i think you and lily would have a really good time playing it you should look into it whenever it comes out or sometime down the road yeah it did look kind of like that kind of kid-friendly kind of appealing look to it i think we are going to be busy with another game though that's coming out in february called uh lunar what is it uh the full name is oh okay oh luna not lunar luna the shadow dust and it's kind of this like point and click adventure game what's notable about it is the like hand-drawn animation 2d animation with it yeah oh i've seen Um, images of this yeah very cute it's got like 20 minutes worth of like just full-on animated cutscenes in it i guess right and it's got this very kind of like over the garden wall meets studio ghibli sort of style to it yeah yeah it's very cute and i'm looking forward to playing through it with uh her and then writing up the review for over there at mariner's rock that'll be cool you can anyone who follows me on twitch can likely expect us to do a second playthrough of it on twitch awesome once it once it's actually released i have to keep things a little under wrap until then yeah but but either way that's one of the projects you're working on uh as soon as zach gets situated with his home situation i do want to explore ashen specifically so ashen is a game that is a souls like from uh, i I'll have to look it up. But anyways, it's got a very simple, like, uh, low-poly art style. And Ashen is really cool so far. I've only played the tutorial area, but it's available on most consoles, I believe, right now. And so me and him have always kind of wanted a Souls-like with a very easy-to-pick-up-and-play co-op experience. And I'm hoping that Ashen is that. And there might even be three-player, too. What was the anime one that just came out that kind of had that... It was touted as a cooperative dark souls but it was like Code a Bane. cell shaded uh-huh. yes that's right how was that, that? did you look that's when that i like played at pax and didn't feel a deep connection with it this one feels like a more traditional souls like experience but it does seem to be a little on the easier side by comparison of course and we've got it on the playstation okay. 4 the other thing that i want to mention that i'm going to be getting to because we, we were given review copies of Ashen, so Ashen is definitely on our list of things to get done for February, and I do want to do that co-op experience on our Twitch channel. But the other game that I'm getting ready Sweet. to play is called Disintegration, which is something I played a round of at PAX West. This is a game that was created, in part at least, by some of the original people that worked on Halo. There's a lot of production value in this. Disintegration is basically a MOBA shooter almost, like your Overwatch. But it has a real-time strategy element attached to it. So you're in these, like, flying units, 
and you're not only like shooting and dropping abilities and stuff, but you're also commanding these little dudes. And so your little dudes have all these different checks and balances against other players' group. And they have abilities, they have, okay. like, auto-targeting things. But it's this weird mix of, like, MOBA and real-time strategy and first-person shooter. And it works really well. Interesting. So the closed beta is happening, I think, sometime this week. I think it starts on Tuesday. So somewhere between Tuesday and Wednesday, I'll be playing a little bit on the PC. I don't know if I can share that, but if I can, I will. Sweet, dude. Yeah, it's cool. I didn't get to talk to the devs much because it was one of those, like, we're going to give you a presentation. Now you play with some people. Get out of my house. <laughs> <laughs> but it was cool. I had a couple of games like that with uh, with the PAXs that I've gone to where it was like you get yeah, in and it, out. It wasn't the personalized experience. No, it wasn't the personalized experience that most of my meetings were. And I definitely prefer those, like, more intimate conversations. But at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. I mean, you get what you get depending on the availability and how they've set up their booths and all that kind of stuff. Right. If they don't have the manpower to handle one-on-ones, then they're all busy yeah. running the booth itself. So Now, aside from things that we're playing here soon for various projects and stuff, and I still... Am in the process of wrapping up what I'm doing for System Shock 2. What have you been into, man? What's been firing you up? I mean, this week has been... I've been pretty busy, but I would say that the thing that got me fired up the most this week was I had an opportunity to, like, hang out and meet local animators from where I live. And so kind of, like, scoping out what, the, like, the next year is going to look like mm -hmm. and what opportunities are going to be available and what people are working on and just seeing other people that are working on the same stuff I am and in the same industry just, like, was just... What what I needed to kind of get my butt in gear and do things. From last week to this week, not a whole lot has changed in terms of like what I'm playing and what I'm watching and getting into. I did discover that the there's not only did I discover that there's a Nino Kuni anime movie, it's available to watch on Netflix. So I will be watching that very soon because I am a big fan of that series. I almost watched it last week, but we determined to watch something else. The cool thing about what Netflix is doing in that space too is they also will be having the the upcoming Dragon Quest animated movie and that looks really neat. Oh, I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah, if, if you want to, you as an animator, I think will particularly get a kick out of it. If you get a chance to look up the trailer for just Dragon Quest movie, it's like this 3D animated thing. It's very pretty. Interesting. I guess otherwise... In that same note, they announced, or they finally showed a trailer for that remake of the Pokemon First movie that's going to be apparently all 3D. Oh, that doesn't interest me as much, but <laughs> what do you got on it? <laughs> I don't have much. I, I watched it, and I think it looks pretty good. Like, they did a pretty decent job of translating that kind of cartoon look yeah. to... I, I mean, I'm certainly not going to be as nostalgic for the... Because part of the experience of watching Pokemon the First movie is how it looks... And that kind of older 90s made for TV but got a big budget for a movie kind of look to it was exciting at the time. And now we've seen so much Pokemon, even just the episodes actually have pretty decent budgets for some pretty decent animation. And so this is kind of like a let's show the first movie to a new audience and hopefully get some money from the people who are nostalgic for it kind of vibe. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'm a little not as behind is new voice acting. So all of these characters already have distinct sounds to me and hearing different voices come out of them. I'm kind of like, oh, I don't know. And that's just me being an old man and not liking change. But I will, if Lily wants to go, I will not hesitate to take her because I'm all for doing that kind of, kind of stuff with her. And the longer I can keep her interested in nerdy things, the easier it is for me. I don't think you're going to have to wait for this, dude. I think Netflix has it. Mewtwo Strikes Back Evolution arrives Pokemon Day, February 27th, only on Netflix. You don't have to go to the theaters. Just watch it at home. Oh, that's fair. Then I'll just watch it at home. Yeah. But we might just, like, make a thing of it, you know? That'd We're be fun. sit down and watch this movie, grab some snacks, order a pizza. I don't know. That weekend is um, also Kim's birthday, but somewhere around there, we should do a Pokemon episode. Maybe that comes out that day or something. That'd be cool. Uh, I, I've been wanting then, to get uh, Jesse on the show. Netflix is also has announced a animated Witcher. Oh, yeah. I haven't heard if it's a series or just a movie, or maybe they're doing both. I don't know. But uh, that could be interesting. It Kind of a, exploring the lore a little bit in smaller stories would be kind of cool to mm -hmm. complement what they're doing with the live action um i don't know anything about the voice casting or anything like that uh, i haven't looked into it too much i just saw that it was a thing apparently but yeah netflix is doing some pretty cool things 
with anime right now. Do you now. know offhand what that Nino Kuni movie is about? Is that about either game or is it its own thing? It's its own complete thing. I've watched the first 15, 20 minutes of it and then I got too tired and had to go to bed. So I will probably finish it when I'm done recording. So it's a totally a whole new thing. I haven't even really seen any references to the games yet other than like locations and the fact that, you know, it's kind of a world built with like there's animal people. Yeah. So I'm not entirely sure what the Nino Kuni specific angle is aside from people from our world are transported to a, a magic world. <laughs> it's an isekai because we needed more of those. <laughs> right. But it's not bad so far. Cool. Definitely got an interesting angle. Aside from the Nino Kuni angle, there's some, you know, maybe slightly tropey, but I dig it story of friendship and what all that means and how the worlds are connected very cool so i guess i can go into some of the anime i've seen recently i stumbled upon and i wasn't really aware that this existed even though i like had a a slight inkling of its of where it takes place but i sat down and watched gundam nt which is narrative and this is taking place immediately after the events of gundam unicorn and gundam unicorn ends in this like batshit crazy weird like metaphysical sort of situation and so it was cool to see what everybody's reaction to that event was so it got evangelion on you not as good well it wasn't as impactful, I think. It just it tried. It fell out of place, personally. But Gundam always has this weird, like, new type psychic thing going on with it. So it, like, kind of made sense, and it was kind of cool. But also, the whole time, I'm like, I don't know what's exactly going on, and I'm just confused. <laughs> yeah, I, I end up being super picky about the... Like, it's hard to sell me on an anime most of the time. Partially because I had friends that were only they would only watch anime and everything anime was the best and then i would watch it and go no this is definitely not the best and so i i've grown (laughs) hesitant on a lot of anime but i've gotten pretty good at when i see something i think i'm gonna enjoy i usually enjoy it and if i don't get into it in the first like so many episodes depending on how long it is i'm like this has not sold itself on me and the I've had so many, well, you got to get through the first 50 episodes. I'm like, I don't got time to watch 50 episodes of, like, can I skip to episode 51? Well, no, you need, like, what, you need to know what happens in the first 50 episodes. And I'm like, all right, well, then if it takes 50 episodes for it to get good, then I'm not going to watch it. Which Gundam has been doing a lot of these movies that give you the highlights of the series, because a lot of the series are 50 episodes long. So sometimes they'll break that into two or three movies, release it as that, maybe add some extra flair to the animation. And so you get the gist of the stories that way. And right now, I think that's the best way to kind of experience a lot of the older Gundam stuff. So that's what I've been exploring Mm. recently. And I, I came across this one because I'm just going through a list of Gundam series and I was like, oh, narrative. I, I've seen the mech for that. The mech looks kind of cool. And then I loaded up. I was like, oh, shit, this is a sequel to Unicorn. I just watched that. Oh, that was good timing because the- you could have accidentally watched it out of order and been very confused. Yeah. But the other thing that's really got me tickled is there's been a bunch of animation just kind of celebration things put out. And one of which is this Digimon nostalgia video that Bandai did. And I've got it play in here, but I can link it to you later if, if you want. Now, I love the Digimon franchise for all it's worth. There's been some really kind of lackluster games over the years, but I've always enjoyed this franchise. And so watching this trailer that's just like a celebration of the brand is the same type of feeling I got when they released those like tear jerky trailers for Pokemon. It's the same energy. Huh. I also just sent you a link of something that I watched animated that uh, kind of got me excited about animation. They, it was an animation collaboration of these artists reanimating to the original audio of an old Looney Tunes cartoon called The Dover Boys, directed by Chuck Jones. Oh, cool. It's a very ridiculous, like, it, it was the only time the characters were ever featured in a lot of ways was an experiment on smear frames. Okay. And how they were, like, developed. But it's kind of cool seeing all these artists come together and, like, get so many second chunks of this cartoon to rewatch. It's got some really great just, like, lines and jokes and gags in it. The villain in it is called Dan Backslide, which is just a fantastic name. I've seen this done with Shrek and Spongebob episodes. Okay. But yeah, this is with, like, an old old looney tunes cartoon and i would definitely highly suggest watching the original as well it's just fantastic but it was yeah it was just fun to watch all these animators like reimagine some of these scenes some of them are just frame for frame 
exactly what happens, but with a different art style. And some of them, they take it in a new direction, and you can tell they really went all out to create something new. Cool. But yeah, it's very funny. That is neat. I love whenever like things are pulled out of history and then given some love and attention. That Digimon thing looks pretty cool, but yeah, it definitely reminds me of uh, those 90s Pokemon commercials where like they're wandering around and the Pokemon are wand- walking through the streets and things like that. Well, you know that recent one they had that was like, this is why we love Pokemon and it had the, the kid in Japan like admiring the, the creatures all throughout his life and how it like came full circle and he was sharing it with like his kids or something? I think I did see that, yeah. It's got that same vibe to it. It's a very similar okay. in tone video yeah i'm gonna be honest i haven't followed anything digimon since i think the third season and honestly it was the third season that i ended up watching the most because during that year i would go visit my grandma every weekend and that's when that season was airing and she had cable nice and we did not have cable at home so i never watched it at home yeah i watched those episodes as they came out whenever i was a kid and it always seemed like an event when they hit like the end of a major portion because they they would take like an hour and say okay we're gonna play both episodes back to back and we're gonna hype it up throughout the next month and there was all these like little in-betweens in between the the like fox block or whatever and so it was always just something that felt really powerful whenever those final episodes came out it's the same way the tsunami hyped up bits and pieces of dragon ball z i remember them doing things like to be sure to tune in for the and then whatever show it was season finale movie and it was literally just like three episodes shown back to back yeah it was a cool <laughs> time i like digimon personally i think it has a much better plot than pokemon in every sense of the word oh definitely the games for pokemon are way better but man digimon's got some cool stuff right i, I would agree with that i think it, with the ever-changing cast though and now there's like there's so many digimon for sure it's even harder to follow than pokemon but at least pokemon Pokemon is genius marketing. By watching the show, you easily learn. And because Ash is a moron, Ash has to learn everything. And because Ash has to learn everything, you as the audience member also learns everything. He is an audience surrogate, isn't he? He definitely is. And so, and then things like, get who's that Pokemon? And then you get the silhouette. Like, genius levels of marketing went into that TV show. It's so good. Like, if you really break it down, it's no wonder it became a cultural phenomenon because it really just, like, everything tied together so well. And I think that's less so with the Digimon properties. Like, not all the video games tied in super well with the show and all every season of the show was different and had new characters and so if your favorite character from the previous season or like chapter wasn't there you would kind of like eh. and that's why when they brought in back crowd favorites for certain seasons like guess who's back and people would get excited and tune in and then realize it's still not the same the other thing that pokemon did better than digimon was the card game and there's this great essay that jay Witz just put out that kind of highlights why the digimon card game didn't do so well and it was because when it was brought over to the west and in global audiences they actually changed some of the rules and it made the game worse because the rules were already kind of weird for the original card game. The, and that card game is actually still doing pretty well in Japan. Interesting. I think there's yeah. even efforts to bring back a Digimon card game. I think that Bandai are going to be hitting the Digimon franchise really hard over the next couple years. And I'm basing this on not only that recent video that I was just highlighting, but also just some of the game releases they have going on. There's Digimon Survive, which is like a tactical RPG. There's a couple mobile games I think they're doing. So th- hmm. there's a lot of things happening right now for Digimon. The only Digimon ga- video game I have strong memories of was uh, on the PS1, I think it was. There was a Smash Brothers clone. Oh, Digimon Rumble Arena. That would probably be it. That's it. And then I think the se- when the second one came out, we were excited about it and played it. And it wasn't as fun. Yeah, the first one's fine. It's not good, though, if you like go to revisit it because the frame rate's awful <laughs> so it just feels really really slow but i played the the heck out of that game i love that and i love the digimon world series yeah i, I have no experience with that one the other thing that bandai was really kind of touting this past week they had a lot of videos go out they put out a video for an anime soccer game that i am actually excited for do you know anything about captain subasa I know what you told me randomly earlier this week about it being a soccer anime that's been around for 20 years. Yeah, so it started in like the 80s, so 40 years. And this comes out of the the same era that like classic Gundam and things were in print. So you can kind of tell based on the art style of the characters. But this anime game 
looks pretty cool. It's a soccer game, right? So there's a lot of elements in soccer games that are actually pretty fun, but they always kind of like do fiddly stuff with players and realism that I don't like. And so the idea of an arcadey, really overhyped soccer game is something I'm like super into. Is this going to be kind of like the next Mario Strikers for those that are looking for that? Actually, yeah. If I had any other thing to compare it to, Mario Strikers might be it. You literally have nothing else to compare it to, let's be honest. Well, Mega Man Soccer. I've never heard of that. There's a lot of things you could. There's a bunch of like arcade NES and Super Nintendo soccer games. But apparently Captain Tsubasa has been around for a long time. There's even a long history of games that never came to the West. But this like refresh for the franchise, I think, is kind of in line with a new anime series they did recently within the last few years. It'll be interesting to see how it does worldwide. Yes, and if you want gameplay, Arex, the guy who does all the Monster Hunter videos and Destiny videos, he has gameplay footage. He, like, was at Bandai. This looks so ridiculous. I know, it looks really fun. Without a doubt, this is the most popular sport in the world. Hands down. And so I'm surprised there aren't more, or football soccer games that kind of spin on it. Especially in recent years, because you get the PES and FIFA games. That come out every year. Uh, That's kind of it. And it seems like, from what I've heard, that the most recent ones haven't been great. They've been kind of going the same route as the Madden series. They've lost a lot of quality pumping out a new game every single year. And so, while initially the engine they had was really great, now the engine is dated and lagging in what it can do and should be keeping up with in terms of innovating the gameplay, and even visually. Not only that, but so many of the sports games have just evolved into glorified gambling machines, where you're just trying to get players and stats and stuff, and it's just not good for the industry. Or the genre, which is why sports games took such a dive in quality. I love a good American football game. If I'm going to play a video game that's football, you got to give me something to do other than just regular football. And so like Blitz the League or NFL Blitz on the N64 and Blitz the League on PS2 later are great spins on the game that make it incredibly fun and push it over the top that you would never see in real life because it is a video game. And this seems like a really great Mario Strikers had kind of filled that role for a while. Haven't seen a new game in that for very long. And there's only been one, right? Uh, no, there was a second one, I believe, on the Wii. Really? Yep. Hmm. I know. I, I was surprised when I heard about it, too. I was like, I don't remember hearing about that one. And then I vaguely remember a friend being excited. One friend being excited about it in high school because he left it on the GameCube. Mario Strikers Charged? that sounds right yeah you're right so there's mario super mario strikers on the gamecube and then mario strikers charged on the Wii, and that's all we've gotten but that that's the kind of like interesting weird way to interpret sports that i've missed because i really like games like nba jam right just looking at that box art could it be any more 90s oh the subasa or the Mario Strikers. Strikers. Yeah, it's so but cool. It, it reminds me it reminds me a lot of the same art style used on like the NBA or NFL Street series. Those were fun too. There's so many things we're missing out on in sports and it's the perfect thing to sit down and make a game for. I'm excited for Captain Tsubasa. I think it's going to be really cool. I think anime is a perfect avenue for pushing the sports drama. Yeah. Like one of the most popular sports anime and mangas out there is in fact a tennis based one Mm -hmm. prince of tennis i found that show to be fairly entertaining even the the manga was entertaining to watch but i would never just sit down and actually watch tennis no (laughs) or (laughs) i wouldn't play tennis or even play a tennis video game but you give me a tennis video game where i can blast a tennis ball so fast it creates a crater on the other side of the arena i'm in sold Other (laughs) anime that, like, because my wife really likes sports anime, and so we watch a lot of, like, Haikyuu, Kuroko no Basket, which is the basketball one. Haikyuu is a volleyball one that's very fun. And recently, there was a run of a show called Hanamaro Zumo, which is a sumo-based one, and that one is very cool. That sounds cool. They all follow similar tropes. You have one archetype and then another archetype, and they just kind of clash. So they get kind of samey, but there's almost always some sort of pull that makes it still interesting. (laughs) For Haikyuu, it's moments of just epic animation that happen over the span of seconds. Like, right when they connect with the ball, (laughs) it'll go into hyper detailed mode and it's really neat to watch yeah no i just love how they're not shy of just going all the way and over the top there's too much concern these days about keeping things too grounded and they're almost Mm -hmm. pulling back too much 
to keep realism in place. And I'm just like, I see realism all the time. Give me something new to watch. And that's just my perspective. I know some people really appreciate realism and like yeah. really grounded content. I'm just not one of them. So this this is one that I might actually check out. Definitely worth a rental. Like if I got some friends together and hosted a stream of us just playing, this would be a good game for that. Regardless, it was the most surprising piece of news that I had seen that week because it was floating around Twitter. I watched it and I was like, holy crap, this is actually incredible looking and I want to know more now. Other major news, Joe, involves my favorite thing that I've been championing for <laughs> a, a long, long, long time. Blue Point Games. Oh, let me guess. Do you have a guess? <laughs> no, I don't need to guess. I can you read know. the document, but you have been talking about this for a while. So Blue Point Games apparently have revealed that their next game is going to be one of their biggest titles they've ever worked on. And a lot of people are interpreting that in a couple different ways, whether it be, you know, as far as like actual size of the game or as far as like the length of a game. And a lot of people are kind of pointing to two games still. It's either going to be Demon Souls or Legend of Dragoon is what people are hoping. And while I would really love to see a Demon Souls remake because I absolutely love Dark Souls and I would love to revisit all those ideas that were really kind of profound in Demon Souls, Legend of Dragoon is one of my favorite RPGs and I wanted something to happen with it really bad. Right. And it would be cool to see it reimagined and redone and given the detail that could really make it shine. That game had so much imagination and just, like, unique visuals to it. And a lot of interesting ideas to, like, spin the RPG formula. Yeah, and like the uh, concept of a dragon. The first dragon you see is a giant praying mantis-looking thing. Yeah, that's true, too. They kind of broke the mold, too, in certain things, like certain character archetypes being definitely evident but also broken and turned on their head yeah so a lot of tropes were played with uh did you know rose was apparently blonde originally hmm. some early concept art of her was recently shared on one of these various forums and yeah she apparently was blonde at one point in the design process interesting so the the thing that i heard this week that kind of has me excited is i'm a fan of the order 1886 on ps4 it could be because i got it for five dollars <laughs> Yeah, that'll and do not it. 60, but I really liked it. It introduced a really cool world of like the Knights Templar have been fighting this battle against like werewolves for a long time. And the titles of the various knights or the, the names of the original Knights Templar knights have become titles. So when you get inducted into the, the Knights Templar, you take on like, all right, I am now Sir Gawain sort of thing. And I, all of these ideas are really cool. The immense detail, it's a fantastic looking game. You can like look at every single model in the game and like mm -hmm. see all the details and the engraving on all the guns. You know, Nikola Tesla is their weapons manufacturer and like just really fun story bits on all this stuff. But there is rumor of a sequel actually being in development. I thought this was a series that was just dead. Nothing was going to happen to it due to the mixed, the really mixed, mostly negative reviews because of its unfortunate, very short length. And I thought for sure that it wasn't going to be anything. Well, now there is rumor that there is going to be a sequel and it will not be a PlayStation exclusive. It will become a, it'll be cross-platform with uh well, not, yeah, it'll be available on multiple platforms, initially starting with the Xbox Series and PS5. And it's, again, looking to push the boundaries visually of what is capable with video games. Because this game still looks good. And it is an old game at this point on the PS4. Came out in 2013, 2014? Yeah, that's a, that's a long time for a game to be out for it to look this good. This is one that I've always wanted to sit down and play because I like werewolves, and I don't think there's enough werewolves in video games. There's like some really cool scenes that I've seen out of this title. That said, it's like a five-hour experience, right? Right, it's not very long. It's not very long at all. And it ends on a note clearly setting up a much bigger story, and so I've always wanted to see it finished or continued in some way. And there's just been so many things happening in relation to this game that I thought it was dead. So to hear this week that a sequel is possible is exciting news for me. Now that comes from Ready at Dawn Games, and I'm curious on what other things they've put out since. They were an extension, it appears, of Santa Monica, who worked on the God of War series. Right. So Ready at Dawn, I think the last major thing, according to their website, is the Echo VR and Lone Echo. Two very big VR projects. And yeah. I think and Echo they, VR they is even PSP. like a competitive esports sort of thing. And I think they are most known, aside from Order 1886, uh, the... 
PSP God of War games. Oh, okay. They apparently they worked on Okami as well and Daxter. Yeah, so a lot of PSP titles first, and then Deformers, that weird little like kind of party game where you're these squishy little animals. They worked <laughs> on that too. And since yeah. then, they've been working on this sci-fi VR stuff with uh, Lone Echo, which people apparently like pretty well, and then Echo Arena and Echo Combat. So a lot of VR things. Yeah. So it would be cool to see them come back to the console space in a narrative sense. I mean, they've definitely, I think they proved themselves to be capable of some pretty unique ideas. They just didn't create an experience that was long enough to satisfy the customers who paid $60 for it. On top of a brand new PlayStation. Right. Because it was a launch title, I think, or close to it. Yep. And it was one of those games, I think, that I was like, this is a game that I want a PS4 for. Yeah. And then it was like six hours long and I was like, eh, okay, fine. And then when I finally got a PS4, after about a year, it was on sale for five dollars and i was like you know what even if it's short for five dollars i'll give it a shot and it ended up being great i really really liked it so apparently it comes from a leaker on neogaf and so that post just kind of comes out of the blue and says you know here's some very cool things that i have seen for this game and i don't know we'll see i always take any sort of forum leak with a grain of salt right they could be talking about they don't ever outwardly say order 1886 yeah but by based off of what he describes is similar to what is described what was described about the original mm -hmm. so it could be a totally new project could be i think people are wanting to see the like the finale to the story or the con the continuation of the story it's got a following hopefully ready at dawn has learned their lesson and put forth the effort necessary to like really give players that really deep engagement that they were looking for now was there any replay value to the original game like could you play through it with i don't know infinite anime or something i'm uh, not that i recall okay yeah that's the other thing too is not a ton of replay value unless like there you can't play as other characters there's not really much for trying out like oh i'm gonna focus on trying to kill with the shotgun this time so a lot of your arsenal and stuff is kind of predetermined for the most part is there like trophies and stuff yes there is and in my initial playthrough through i did not earn very many of them so i i don't know what is required to get a lot of those trophies it's like really weird so at the very least maybe it would be a fun one for trophy chasers to get the yeah. platinum on because that apparently exists there's a lot of players out there that are really into it i stopped worrying about achievements after it became a hassle to look at them because the 360 had the best achievement system period you just hit a button load it up in the foreground you see what you're missing cool go chase them now here's a story that comes from a source that we normally don't ever get to talk about we have a cnn story <laughs> That's why I added it. I was like, oh, the CN CNN has apparently added this. I had seen in an earlier Reddit post that Plague Inc., the disease simulation game that is super popular on mobile platforms, to this day, I think it is one of two mobile games I've actually purchased. Because I had the free version, I was sick and tired of playing it with ads, figured I'd throw the dev some money so that I didn't have to deal with ads, so I bought it, and I played it quite a bit. So, essentially, more people are playing Plague Geek now that there's a bunch of, like, disease-related stories traveling through the world. Right, so with the epidemic in China with the coronavirus, the popularity of the game has risen. And the devs, since seeing the popularity of their game come out in the wake of this news, has had to come forward and say, please do not look at our game for any actual real life application or information. It is for fun only because they recognize that they don't want to spread misinformation. This is actually a very serious thing. And so they wanted to get ahead of any accusation that they are trying to say one thing or another about the threat of the coronavirus. It makes me wonder if like a research group or something was using Plague Inc. as a simulation platform and wanted to know how they could tweak it. So they like messaged Endemic or something. And then Endemic are like, wait, 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 don't do that. It's a game. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. But it is interesting in how real life and like it it is it's funny how often video games and disease end up in headlines together yeah just like uh years ago with the there was a, a glitch that was spreadable in world of warcraft oh yeah i remember that and it became a whole thing people have used it as a simulation model 
to study the spread of disease in real life. It's been very accurate and applicable to real world situations. And so it's it's kind of an interesting look into like no one was actually hurt. Yeah. So it was like a safe study of human behavior in an epidemic. That disease was an interesting situation because I think that's around the time that either I dropped WoW or was getting ready to drop WoW. I only played for maybe two or three months. But I remember that being a thing, that you could just spread a disease to various players. <laughs> Some people were like, I'm going to be patient zero. Here comes the hurt. <laughs> Other folks were <laughs> wanting to try to keep people in a particular server or something. But yeah, that's uh, that's a thing. Video game developers had to come out and say that their game is not real life. <laughs> Our game is for fun and entertainment, not right. for any sort of educational purpose about disease. Going back to the reboot conversation we were having, there are rumors of EA working on a new Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic reboot. It's unclear is if this is a remaster or a re-release or remake of the originals, or if it's a third game in the story, or if it's something totally new. But it is not going to be related to the MMO. It's going to be a standalone single player experience. At least that's what the rumor is saying. And it will be taking aspects from the first two original games. Apparently a lot of this information is coming from Cinelinks, but we have the Eurogamer article linked on it. On Cinelinks, they were talking about how it, you know, it might be something that is happening, especially considering that one of the villains, Darth Revan, was made officially canon, based on a couple smaller details. Oh, interesting. It's also unclear as if the original developers or the original studio will be getting their hands on this project, or if EA will be shuffling it to a different studio. I mean, at the end of the day, if you give it to Respawn, it makes a lot of sense, right? Because they just put out a Star Wars game. That is true. It would be nice to see by Bioware, given one of their original IPs to continue working with? Mm, I'd like to see Bioware kind of axed, honestly, and given to somebody else. I want to see them separate in the fashion that Bungie did, because I don't think EA needs... They, they can't handle the group. There's so many cool things that Bioware were working towards that just fell apart because of seemingly bad management, especially if you go by a lot of the reports that were shared by people like Jason Trier, who really dived into that history on why certain things were happening with Anthem. Well, it, it just kind of seems like, you know, not just Bioware, but a lot of studios were like, hey, here's this cool thing we're making so that you, EA, can make a lot of money. And then people who don't know anything about video games say, well, we want to make even more money than that. So mm -hmm. we're going to require you add this aspect into the game. And in, in the efforts... This is how Dead Space went through the shitter. Right. And in the efforts of adding those things made the game bad, specifically those things. The game wasn't bad seemingly before then. Added this new stuff, made game bad, reception was poor, and it, it didn't hurt EA all that much. It hurt the people who made the game. Mm -hmm. I'm not a big fan of companies cannibalizing, ruining, and then not doing anything with some of the properties they have. EA is notorious about that. That's the. Th I don't understand how it's a wise business decision to buy a company that is known for producing successful content and then forcing them to create, not letting them do the thing they're good at. Well, it's short-sighted is what it is. A lot of these investors and stuff want a turnaround within you know, a quarter or two. So they're doing things based on, or they're asking for things based on what other companies are doing at that exact moment, which is how you wind up with video game trends. Yeah. That's why Battle Royales were anyway. fucking everywhere there for the longest time, but who's left? We Fortnite. Can, <laughs> Apex. We can, we can complain about EA all night, but that's not what the podcast is about. We could make that a podcast episode. <laughs> it could be a thing. Here's all the bullshit that be, EA has done that I don't like. Let's be honest. It could be its own podcast. True. Speaking of companies that do some shit I don't really care for, Activision have signed an exclusive deal with YouTube for their esports live streaming events. Now this covers Overwatch, Call of Duty, and one more that I don't remember that probably doesn't matter a whole lot. Hang tight. Uh, Hearthstone <laughs> and World of Warcraft esports, because apparently that can be competitive in Interesting. some situation. I'm not downplaying any of the players. Y'all do what you do. I I'm sure that whatever you're doing is incredible. Right. 
It's just that it's kind of a big deal for Activision to be like, you know what, we're just doing YouTube, which apparently they did with Overwatch as an experiment throughout 2018 and to now. And so that contract has died and now they're like all right we're just gonna put all of our properties on there and sign another deal with youtube so it's just interesting because esports live has been such a a mainstay of the twitch culture that it's strange to think about it for youtube well overwatch league was becoming big enough that it was being aired on espn oh it's huge and I think the, the reason that it became so big is because Overwatch League was designed with cities in mind. You have teams based on particular areas, and they're given, like, a team name. You can root for your hometown. Like, there's a, a local connection there immediately, and I think that's why it succeeded so well. But yeah, YouTube. I don't watch a lot of esports, but apparently if you want to watch these particular games, you're going to have to switch to YouTube. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit curious as to what that's going to mean for... Because there was a lot of integration with Twitch and Overwatch League. Mm-hmm. And if that is being moved over, that's going to change the landscape for it a little bit. Apparently they're confident enough because they've been on YouTube since 2018, at least for Overwatch. Right, but over I know even up to this year, I myself caught a, a number of Overwatch League matches on Twitch. Hmm. If it's going to be exclusive to YouTube, I wonder what that's going to mean for their viewership. Yeah. That's the big question, because a lot of people that are on Twitch expect things to kind of just be there, right? Like, if you're somebody who really watches esports, you're almost always going to turn to Twitch, if I had to guess, or that particular company's website. Yeah, that's true. And I think that there's even probably an integration in Battle.net. I haven't opened Battle.net since they went through all that nonsense with, uh, oh, what was the major controversy we had recently with Blizzard? Uh, the one where they banned a player for speaking a personal opinion about the uh, riots in China. Yeah. Ever since then, I have an open battle net. And the punishment was more severe than the punishment given to someone who was caught actively cheating multiple times. Yeah. So the story where they were basing this discussion on comes from PCGamer.com. And the writer there is Andy Chalk. So thank you, Andy, for putting in the efforts for that article because we're here talking about it now. Something akin to one of our favorite things that we actually watch that involves high levels of player skill, the Frame Fatales Winter Event, Frost Fatales, starts in late February. This is an all-women speedrunning charity marathon done by the Games Done Quick people. It's in the same vein as that show, and the charity that these ladies are supporting is the Malala Fund, and This particular charity is one that works on empowering women, educating women, and apparently it's one of the biggest groups that does that. Hmm. And I believe this might even be the first time that the Frame Fatales are doing a charity as part of their streams. Because if I'm not mistaken, they only started within the last year or two, and now they're doing a similar thing that Games Done Quick is doing, just with all ladies. Look, from February 23rd to February 29th, that's a good stretch. Yeah, that's that's a week, right? They're starting strong. That's pretty great. And they might have done something similar to that last year. I remember seeing it, but I didn't actually watch it. This year, I want to watch it. I definitely remember watching some of it last year because I was working a terrible overnight job and it was on, so I watched it. I love this kind of stuff. I think it's really cool to highlight the ladies in speedrunning because speedrunning is really niche anyways, and it does kind of feel like a boys club sometimes. And Games Done Quick is always cool because you see such a wide range of runners. There's so many Mm -hmm. different types of people that I've experienced through Games Done Quick specifically. So I'm excited to learn all these new lady streamers that I haven't seen before or really talented speed runs that just blow people away. (laughs) It's going to be a good opportunity to showcase people that may not have been showcased before and we'll give them an opportunity and the exposure for being more noticed and more apt to be selected for future events. Yeah, either way, I'm down. Frame Fatales is a great name. It is. It's got really solid branding behind it. I can't wait to see the schedule. Yeah, definitely going to be keeping an eye on that one. Maybe we should even uh, pick a time during it to do like a kind of a restream of it where we're watching and reacting to maybe a run of games. Maybe. If anything, I would like to do a recap at the beginning of March. It's like, here's some of the best things that we saw out of Frame Fatales, and here's how much we actually got to sit down and watch. So I'm yeah. planning on putting it on my calendar. The end of February is, again, where Kim's birthday takes place, so we'll be doing some stuff for that. But this will be something that I'll have on in the background, I'm sure. Do you know where it's going to be at? As far as the website, it's going to be hosted on 
twitch.tv slash games done quick. So the typical channel. The schedule is now available, apparently. Ooh, there's a Hollow Knight run and also Ape Escape, Donkey Kong 2, Donkey Kong, Dungeon Dice Mount Monsters on the GBA, Code Lyoko on the DS, that's weird, by Aeon Frodo, Yu-Gi-Oh, Earthbound, Spyro. So a lot of the games that would make sense for speedruns, right? Guitaru, man, that's weird. Is that a 10-minute run of Octopath Traveler? Uh, yeah. I don't think it's 10 hours. No, that should be 10 minutes. Specifically, oh, no, 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 no. That's the setup length that oh, you're looking hour at. hour and 20 minutes. I see yeah, it now. It's hour 20. The time. That's still insane. Yeah, that's pretty good. The Last <laughs> Guardian, that's a three-hour long speed run. God. That would be such an annoying speed run because it's all based on like getting Trico to do certain things. And sometimes Trico just goes, mm, no. <laughs> Closer to four hours, actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. 355. Final Fantasy Tactics A2. That's a game you don't see very often by Nikki. RPG speed runs are fascinating to me. They're really cool. And how th- they've manipulated certain things and figured out certain things like, oh, you don't actually need to level up for about 10, 15 hours. Yeah. If you were playing normally, you could just skip through. Guess what's happening Wednesday? I don't see it. Hit it up, Buck. It's time to rumble. The bit it Buck a bumble. <laughs> Undead Blackbirds running Buck Bumble. Any percent, no door skips on N64. Estimated time at 45 minutes. I'm there. I adore Buck Bumble. Even though it sucks. I've never even heard of it. Oh, th- we did- we went through the same thing with Zach. Go look up the song, Rat Meow. <laughs> this is my favorite part about this podcast sometimes. <laughs> what do you mean you've never heard of Fuck Bumble? Let me blow your fucking mind. <laughs> eh? This is very surprising for a Nintendo 64 cartridge. Uh-huh. There's some quality there. Well, with a track like that, the game has to be good, right? Right. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> and it's this cool little, like, flying around shooter game where you play as a bee with, like, guns and stuff. It's cool. So, Joe, one of my favorite games of recent memory is Dusk on PC, soon to come to consoles, eventually. Was that the Doom clone? It was basically Quake meets, okay. uh, like, a Redneck Rampage, almost. Got it. And so Dusk is this really cool, low-poly shooter with a lot of personality, a lot of speed. The level design is absolutely fantastic. Well, they've recently kind of opened up SDK support, and while I'm not super savvy in the modding scene, they were very quickly able to just take levels out of Quake and load it into the Dusk engine in, like, minutes, and it would run. Interesting. With some caveats, but, I mean, it works, and now there's a full mod site that they've put up and that's dusk.mod.io the modding scene for dusk i hope is going to get very very cool because that game was kind of built sort of with modding in mind because it's a bunch of doom players like of course they want to put in mods you know what we would be interesting to see in an an event that i would be interested in seeing at an sgdq event or an agdq event is something similar to the mario maker relay but with this game with fan made or like People make insane levels, and then people are racing them blind. That would be very cool as, like, a shooter. I think the setup would be weird because, of course, you're, like, getting people to sit down on a mouse and keyboard rather than just handing them a controller. But it could definitely work, and it would be really cool to see. Yeah, I don't know how the relay portion of it would work, or if they would even do a relay, but just giving... All right, here, here's three Dusk Runners, and here's four levels they've never seen before because they were made by... The modding community. All right, good luck. I would be so down with that. It'd be such a cool little addition to the, the speedrun as entertainment. This last AGDQ, I think, was the best in terms of mixing up speedrunning. They're like, we're a al- they're, they're realizing we're a live event. We can do unique things that you can't do otherwise. Let's really embrace that. So you saw a lot of things like the relay races and showcases of certain glitches and things like that with like crowd, crowd control. control. Mm-hmm. Really, really cool ideas and stuff like this would be a great way to add to that uniqueness. And I listen to the Warp World podcast, which are the people that made Crowd Control. So people like Jakku, Xwater, Moni, and all them. And so on their podcast, one of the things that they initially set out as a goal for Crowd Control was to get it on the GDQ stage. And the way they were just like so blown away with people's reactions to it was really heartwarming. What I heard, what I was impressed by is Crowd Control, in preparation for it, they had to set stuff up with twitch to warn them ahead of time that this was happening yeah because they needed to make sure that it was going to keep running when thousands upon thousands of dollars were being pumped through it 
Mm-hmm. And that was what Jakku was doing specifically. Like, they kind of built it with a lot of prototypes. They imagined how it was scale up. And he had his laptop at the show ready to fix something as something went down. Yep, I remember that. I remember seeing him there and just, like, looking at code. And he's like, oh, whoa, whoa, <laughs> He said, surprisingly, it just kind of worked. <laughs> yeah, and he'd have to keep reminding the runner, hey, do you have any bees? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, look at that. Bees, bees, bees. Just Here come the bees. Bottles of bees. Um, <laughs> I need to sit down and watch that VOD. I have yet to do so that. It's so good. Congratulations, Americans. You did something really cool this year. More Americans went to the library than to the movies. And that's pretty cool that people are utilizing those public resources more in this day and age. The article from Lit Hub, it kind of talks about it a little bit. There's some speculation. I, I I found this article on Reddit, and some of the speculation there was a rise of streaming services means that people are just more willing to wait to see if a movie comes to their streaming service of choice. Interesting. And also the rise of popularity of comic books. Comic book collecting and reading is expensive and confusing. Yeah, and so totally. <laughs> libraries, public libraries, have some of the biggest comic book collections in the world. And if you live in, like, Minnesota, where all the libraries are connected through the same network, you can make a request. If the library you're at doesn't have it, they'll get it from another library in the state so that you can get it. It's no, no, really it's weird. Cool. In our library system here in Juneau, we actually have a pretty decent collection of video games. And it's cool because a lot of kids will, like, go after school and play rounds of Smash Brothers and stuff. And it's just something neat. I've seen that becoming more popular in certain libraries, too. I think it depends on what the after-school crowd looks like yeah. and how utilized it is by children. But I think, yeah, people are going, the, when they are going to the movies, they're seeing, like, Avengers Endgame. And they're like, well, I kind of want to, I like this character. So they'll go to the library and look up that character they like and read those comics. Because going out and they'll look it up online and see that, oh, it's $25 or more to get this specific comic trade paperback or where do i even start in a reading a certain character and there, while there are a lot of resources and stuff out there putting money to experiment like that is can like kind of daunting and most people don't want to go that step right if you want to get into comics you want somebody to recommend a couple like excellent things and then maybe you're not even into it so have the tendency to either load up like the marvel app or go to the library, which very well could have it. Right. And so I think that uh, I've noticed in my local library that the comic book collection has nearly doubled in the last couple of years mm -hmm. because the demand has gotten so high and that graphic novels and comics have become its own section of the library. Not just like, here's the shelf of comic books we have, which is what it's been for a long time. It's, this is an entire row, top shelf to bottom shelf, of only graphic novels, including manga. I think another reason why they could be so popular is because for children under the age of, like, 18, there's a lot of adult-centered stories that you can get in a comic book. Because a lot of times I'll go to a library and see their comic offerings, and it's like, oh, here's, you know, comics for kids. And right there in the middle will be the Hel Helsing collection. <laughs> and I'm like, that's not for kids. I saw a Nazi with a baby in his mouth. <laughs> Right. Yeah. That's the danger of this, right? Is people learning about a new medium is realizing, oh, not every comic book is for children. One of the most famous, gra famous graphic novels of all time is a retelling of a person's experience going through the Holocaust. Is that Sandman? Is that what that's about? Uh, no, Mouse. Oh, Mouse. Yeah. yeah so yeah. it's kind of a retelling of the story of the, these mice are fleeing in terror of this fascist regime and all this stuff and definitely not a story i would hand a five-year-old but a perfect story to hand someone taking like a high school world history course yeah but say your 10 year old or something is in a library they could totally pick that up the shelf and your librarian wouldn't necessarily know any better right they would see oh a child with a comic book with a mouse on the front which i'm sure there's a rating <laughs> system in place for comics but i don't know how prevalent that is or as easy to understand as it is for like games it's more like I think it's at the publisher's discretion uh, and more publishers are getting on board with that idea where on the back it will say this title is recommended for ages 13 and up or for example. Right. But there isn't like there isn't an ESRB for comics. It's at the publisher discretion 
it's becoming more common to seeing those things because I think enough people, enough parents complained that they didn't realize they were buying their child something with explicit content in it. And so I think it's just good business sense to be honest about what's inside. That was one of the reasons I was so pulled to manga as a young adult is because I would watch the anime and then find the manga to be like eight times more graphic and violent. And I'm like, whoa, this is way better. <laughs> I'm convinced that like, Naruto makes a better manga because it's just way more. There, there's a lot more child murder happening. <laughs> And it makes it more unique, in my opinion. Right. And reading, like, even just the, the one I have on my desk, Monstrous, on the back, rated M for Mature, doesn't really say why. Oh, yeah. But I don't think that is, there's no, like, rating board or law requiring them to do that. There was also a lot of nudity in manga, too. So I'd be reading, like, Inuyasha, and you would get full chest shots of most of the women so characters. Basically, you're just admitting that you're a thirsty boy. Hey, yeah. <laughs> Especially at the time, because, I mean, I was a young teenager, and even things like Dragon Ball had nudity in it aplenty. Yeah, I'm, as someone who read Dragon Ball as an adult, weird reading experience for me. <laughs> yeah, it's strange, because you're like, wait a minute, all these are definitely not of age. Yeah. <laughs> like, a lot of the naked scenes or the sexy scenes involve Bulma, and she's probably 14, so 15. So, if you are an adult like, eh, listening, eh. listening to this podcast, and you have children going to the library, just skim through the book quick before you let them check it out. Be involved in your Good be advice. involved in your children's content, regardless of age. And ultimately, you might even find something that you like, and then you can share that experience of reading it together and discussing it. That's my advice. Mm -hmm. Being involved in your children's yeah, content, media consumption, is, I think, priority number one after feeding and clothing because of how constant media is in our lives right now. Yeah. That's good, solid advice, I think. Like, I don't just hand my daughter YouTube to watch because... Oh, no. Because <laughs> That's really dangerous three anymore. Three videos in, <laughs> and she's watching Spider-Man spank Elsa. Yeah. Not appropriate for anybody, <laughs> let alone children. I mean, I'm not going to kink shame anybody. No, nah, you do you. But don't, don't and I'm do show me. it to children. And we won't do each don't other. Don't show it to children. Probably. <laughs> Back into the realm of retro-styled shooters, 3D Realms is kind of killing it right now, and I don't know what crawled up their butts to make them this good. <laughs> that is a weird phrase. I'm going to just call you out on that one. So, so recently they put out a game called Ion Fury, which was a kind of retelling of what they did in Bombshell. People didn't like Bombshell at all. It was like an action RPG similar to Diablo, and it was just kind of bad. But then they put out Ion Fury, which was made in the same engine that Duke Nukem was in. The, uh, the, 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 that one engine. Okay. Oh, what's the name of that engine? Shit. Okay. Build engine. That's it. The build engine. Okay. So they made Ion Fury in the build engine, and people actually liked it, and it's surprisingly a good game. I haven't played it yet, but I've seen a lot of people talk about it. People like Lazy Game Reviews. Uh, I think Metal Jesus had a video on it. So it, it's a game that like people are excited to sit down and play from 3D Realms, which is weird, because a lot of their games have been very lackluster over the years. So they've got one that they've picked up called Wrath Aeon of Ruin, and this is really turning a lot of heads. People are into this one. It's another like hyper-violent, here's a bleak world with a lot of blood and guts and action, and it's that style of thing built in, like, the original Quake engine. Hmm. And so, basically, there was this one one or two people working on it, and 3D Realms is like, oh, we'll help you out and publish it, and now it's a thing. <laughs> and it looks fucking cool. Like, arm blades and stuff, really simple PS1-style textures, chewing up enemies with, like, chain guns. Like, it's just the type of action that I want in these type of shooters. Huh. And it looks good in motion, man. Like, this is a really cool-looking game. But apparently it was playable at the last PAX South that just happened recently. And yeah, it looks pretty sick. It's available now in early access. You can play it now if you wanted to. Very, very unique art style. Has a lot of similar energy that like Doom Eternal has as far as like speed and dismemberment and things of that nature. That's cool. I am totally here for it. But 3D Realms is also doing another game, and that one is called Kingpin Reloaded. So this is a remake of a game that they had called Kingpin... Uh, let me find the subtitle for it. For those of you that enjoy free things, the 3D Realms catalog has a decent number of free games in them. I don't know if they're any good, but they're like kind of older retro games for sure, but they are free. So yeah, if you wanted they've to got like some classics. 
if you wanted to check out some old games to kind of like get a feel for the history of video games, this is a great place to start. So Kingpin was originally a title that was made in the Quake 2 engine because a lot of id software was peddled out to other groups and so they would make games in that engine because John Carmack's programming was just so tight, right? But back in 1999, they released a game called Kingpin Life of Crime. And so that's what this is. This is a remake of that. And this remake has like 4K resolutions, ultra wide, uh, better graphics, of course. And it doesn't look bad. I mean, it more retro inspired shooters. I'm kind of just like addicted to that genre right now. And some of the comparison shots they have are just really cool. Hmm. It's neat. It's definitely a, a different type of game than probably what we usually get with these retro inspired shooters. But I love this genre a lot because a lot of the games I missed out on, I only got to like hear about them from things such as X-Play or Attack of the Show even back in the early 2000s. Video game TV before it became, well, there was like a dating reality show and then Cops. Yeah, that's pretty much all they had on G4. There was a really weird show I remember on G4 that was literally just 20 minutes straight of just random clips of video games. Hmm. And it was often games that were not released in the States. Oh, okay. So you would just see a clip of some random Japanese game that you'll never see ever again. This is a weird, and there would just be like music and like sound effects and stuff. And it's super weird. And there was no like fanfare or t- like no introduction or host. It was literally just 20 minutes of just random video game clips back to back. Huh. I have no idea. There's a game that I'm looking for right now that's also being published by New Blood, and it's like the worst kept secret in games because they are publishing it, I think, but they they don't like have it listed on their website. Is it related called... to Gloomhaven? Well, it's it's that type of title. It's Gloom something. Gloomwood? Because Gloomhaven is the insane tabletop game that takes you hundreds of hours to play. Oh, yeah, yeah. So Gloomwood is the one that I'm thinking of, which is a spin off like classic thief games with some survival horror elements in it. This is another like small dev group, and this game looks freaking cool. I see a lot of things shared about it on Twitter, and so this is another like retro inspired game specifically for retro fps that i'm keeping an eye on i'm like super pumped for this this looks really cool gloomwood is the name of it should be neat i think should be that about wraps us up for news isn't it are we done yeah i think we're done yep that's what we could find yeah in our one hour of prep time (laughs) give or take games that should be remade and the companies that should do it joe the ultimate topic (laughs) the the best topic (laughs) that we could come up with I think it's a fascinating thing to just kind of, like, mentally kick around. Right, speculating. Yeah, it's fun. And it also highlights some games that we just missed that are super good. So tell me, my friend, out of all the things we have listed, what do you want the most? I honestly don't know. I mean, if they were to... So I've got listed here Final Fantasy VI in the style of Octopath Traveler. So whatever dev team did that, not Square Enix, because they just published it, I think. Square Enix published it, and but they did... They did work with them a lot to make sure that it was going to work and be what it was. So Square Enix would probably still be pretty heavily involved because it is their game. But it would just be it would I think it would breathe new life into the classic Final Fantasy game. Look like there's just some weird options out there for playing these games. You either have to go full retro or for a while they were doing these kind of like chibi style remakes on the DS. Or these really weird, like, flat graphic stock image looking mobile games. The last games. time they did it to a Final Fantasy game, it was 6, and people hated it. Right. And so I think that with the one of the biggest receptions, I think, of Octopath Traveler was it really brings new life into the pixel art style. Yeah. And seeing Final Fantasy 6 told with that style, I think would really... Along with the Final Fantasy, like if they did this in the wake of Final Fantasy 7 and gave people a new opportunity to play 6, I think it would be pretty It cool. would go over pretty daggone well, I think. The other one that's at the top of my list, Radiata Stories is another JRPG that I played in high school. Square Enix also will release this one. Not many people have played it or even heard of it. And I think to kind of like give it a different taste than the original release or even a chance at maybe being more well known... Level 5 has had really great success with a more cartoony style that the original game has. And with Nino Kuni being kind of under their belt with perfecting that art style, I think they could really like 
draw out what this game looks like and then they also level five also is no stranger to like putting humor in their games and kind of poking fun at the jrpg genre as a whole and this game has lots of moments in it that just had me actually laughing which was even rarer during the ps2 era where being funny in video games was not trendy. No, not typically. I mean, you had things like Disgaea that was still very funny. It's kind of got an action RPG element. You get into your combat, and then you using button presses and combos and stuff is in an, a small arena of the battle. Uh, a little bit more Tales of kind of style of gameplay. Yeah, I've played this one front to back, actually. I love this game a lot. And it had a branching story that was interesting, so it added some replay value. Partway through the game, you have to make a major decision, and it changes the rest of the game pretty dramatically. It basically uh, determines the party that you have and the different storylines you take. Like, they're two very, very different scenarios. And I thought that was really cool. And it it was an interesting world. It had a fun art style. I just think it'd be great to see this one remade. I like Radiata Stories. It's probably one of my favorite PS2 era JRPGs. I've always been told that... What's that one that's basically Dark Cloud 3? Rogue something. Legacy? Galaxy. Rogue Galaxy is another one that was recently ported to PS4 via their like ps2 service so i think that even that game as well rogue galaxy would make a very cool remake and or sequel right and on that note dark cloud dark cloud would be cool also by level five would be neat and right. Gal- What's Rogue Galaxy? so those oh, those okay. are the two that are at the top of my list and then i have a couple others but why don't you tell me clearly we already talked about legend of dragoon yes by blue point games legend of um, dragoon is something that if it is announced i will be putting in an application to work on their narrative that's just something that's happening <laughs> well good luck with that yeah, yeah. If suddenly I disappear from Forever Classic Games, that's what happened. And you see me move to Texas or whatever. All right. I guess uh, now I'm uh, very split on how I feel about this. There are a lot of PS1 games, Joe, that I have a lot of nostalgia and just love for. <laughs> and that must have been just that perfect age, right? So something like Alondra, which is a sequel to Landstalker on the Genesis for people that know that console. And that is, a, it's basically a Zelda clone that's more serious. You play as a character who has the ability to jump into people's minds, similarly to something like Psychonauts, where once you're in there, you like fight their anxieties, manifested as monsters. But it's definitely a Zelda-like top-down experience where you're collecting items, going through dungeons and that kind of stuff. And it's just really well made, and it has a really cool like 80s anime style. And I think that somebody could pick that up and really run with it is Atlas because they have a really good knack for nailing style. And I think if you were to lean into that eighties nostalgia specifically for anime fantasy anime, they could really do some cool things. Yeah, that's true. If, especially if they could really nail, they're getting so much better at making 3d look 2d and in a specific style. Yeah. If they were to nail that kind of eighties anime style, that would be pretty cool. So Alondra is definitely something that I even want to like sit down and explore to uh, on the channel in some way, shape, or form. Like I want to actually sit down and play it all the way through and do like what I did with Metal Gear because it's also a very hard game. Like it is probably the most challenging Zelda-like experience I've played. Yeah, that's my familiarity with this game. Is that uh, oh, what is it? There was a quote that, like not your not your dad's Legend of Zelda or something like that. Now, in the same vein of 80s anime, you know me, I'm on a Gundam kick right now, so anything mechs, I'm just all about. There was a game that I played on PS1 called Battle Assault 2, Gundam Battle Assault 2. This is a stellar game. There's so many cool, like, well, mechanically, it's not great. But art style-wise, there's so many complex sprites at play that it's just damn impressive. And I think a company that's really good at doing things with sprites and fighting games in general is Arc System Works. The same people that brought us Dragon Ball Fighters, they're getting ready to put Grand Blue Fantasy Versus, and the Blaze Blue series, Guilty Gear. So those guys could capture what it felt like to play as a Gundam in this game, and I just want that. I need to replay this. I didn't know you could unlock Dark Gundam. This definitely has a Capcom versus Marvel kind of look to it. It's a very beautiful 2D fighter that just had a lot of charm and personality. Look at how all those different sprites... Are working together i know it's crazy there's so many parts right. it all feels heavy like it's a cool game dude mechanically you can just kind of span the same shit over and over again and it's fine but like it's such a fun thing to play oh it doesn't really know how to handle them overlapping though yeah it ugh, it's cool though i love this game you can play as like most of the g gundam cast which at the time was my favorite series it's so cool dude i love gundam battle assault so i think that 
if we ever get together in person, which I'm sure is inevitable. It'll happen. At some point. We should just do something where we want you introduce me to some Gundam. I actually sit down and watch it with you and we, we talk about it. That could be cool. I've got a couple different places I would point you. <laughs> yeah. Gundam Battle Assault 2 at, or Arc System Works, I think would be perfect. But one I added to our list that I think both of us would add to the list. If I if I hadn't added it to the list, it wouldn't have surprised me to see you add it to the list. Uh huh. Any of the Onimusha games. Yeah, I love Onimusha. I know they just released kind of the HD version of the first one. Right. Which is great. The more people that get eyes on this series, the more likely. I wonder if maybe that was them testing the waters to see what the reception for this would be. Mm, something. I really wanted to put the other two games as a package right. and just like, here's a slightly enhanced port. I mean, it is a cheaper game. It's only 20 bucks, but to only have that first one is a little disappointing because the whole trilogy is really great. I am partial to number two because that's the one that when I bought my PS2, it came with Onimusha 2 because it was used and that's the game that the person who sold it to me had for it. Yeah, I, th- I find the first one to be the strongest entry, but I-, I get why you're into that. And if they were to be totally remade, I would say just let Capcom do it. Let them give it the Resident Evil 2 treatment. Just full out, you know, when people saw that reveal trailer for Resident Evil 2, if I could see an Onimusha cutscene with that same level of quality, oh, I would be so excited. Give me a gorgeous Samonosuke fighting through hordes of demon samurai, please. <laughs> oh my goodness, that would be amazing. And there's some, like, really great, like, horrific demon designs in that in those games. Mm-hmm. I've been watching the Super Beard Bros play through, and I'd for, kind of forgotten how, how many cues they took from the horror genre for those games. Oh yeah, there's some really, like, H.R. Geiger level details, especially in the last area. Yeah, because for me, I played these games. I'm not really a horror game guy, but I never really realized that this was a horror game in a lot of ways. Because I was just like, I'm a badass samurai, I'm gonna chop that guy in half. And, you know, maybe it's because the character has a sword and has magic powers, it kind of loses some of that horror aspect, where you get, where like, I have a gun and I have four bullets. You know? Yeah, I mean, the first game still kind of keeps that classic survival horror gameplay, because it is kind of hard. So a lot of that, like, anxiety in the player is still there. Yeah. I like that series a lot. I recently did a huge retrospective on it that I published on our website, too, because it was originally published on RetroVideoGamer.co.uk, so one of the UK websites. I did it as a guest piece for them, but now there's a video on our YouTube that kind of just me gushing about Onimusha for a little bit. Well, because, like, the third one takes place, like, the modern day, and then, like, uh, the actor Jean something. Yeah, Jean Cousteau. Yeah, is like just straight up in it. Yeah, I mean, he's a character. It's not like him as an actor as a character. It's him playing a character. That was one of the first times I remember seeing, oh, that's like an actual person playing a character in a video game. Yeah, which is what Onimusha is kind of built on because all the main characters are famous Japanese people. Right, but I'm not Japanese, so I don't recognize them. Yeah, and I only know that because I did a bunch of digging on it. So there's a big retrospective on our website about Onimusha. But really, you take anything out of Capcom's classic library, slap the RE games engine in it, and I'll play it. Like, I really want to play Dino Crisis Remade. And that's kind of what people are thinking they may be doing. Because there's an email that went out in their ambassador program that said, hey, sometime early in the year, we're going to find a bunch of people to invite to our facilities or whatever to play this unannounced horror game. And I'm like, that's got to be either something new or whatever they're doing with Resident Evil next or Dino Crisis. There's one on here that you added that I'm a little, I don't think too many people would actually put on their list. So, well, just mostly because I don't think too many people have actually played it. All right. (laughs) Gaelman's Great Adventure. Okay, yeah, so, this is a great game. It's on the N64. Gomon's Great Adventure is in the Mystical Ninja series, where you play as Gomon, Abisimaru, another little ninja dude, and then a ninja girl. And it's a 2D platformer that's really, really hard, that is also a 2.5D style. So this game is actually really cute and beautiful, but it it's just a super challenging N64 game that not a lot of people have played that I owned as a kid. And so this is actually one of the first games that I remember doing a Let's Play of back whenever I was making Let's Plays as Forever Classic. Ooh, nerd. Yeah, it, it's so cool, though. I might have spelled that wrong initially in the thing. But either way, it's a really neat little game, and I think that if you were to give that property to... 
somebody who is also just very good at that style of quirkiness, I think the way forward would be perfect for Gomon's Great Adventure. They've already shown what they can do with River City. They did it with Aliens. They just continue to knock things out of the park stylistically. So Gomon's Great Adventure, way forward. Yes, please. What would that look like to you? Because I, I feel like a lot of N64 games kind of look similar. Like visually, they kind of have to rely on a similar art style. So given what, all the resources that we have today, how would you take that game in a new direction? So if you took a softer animation style, like say in the style of maybe even the newest Kingdom Hearts or like a Pixar kind of look, you could really nail some of these character designs and some of the just like weird designs for the yokai style enemies. But it's a neat game. I've got it on screen now for anybody that's watching us live on twitch.tv slash forever classic games. And a lot of these episodes for news, we are recording live on Twitch now. So if you want to come hang out with us, you're welcome to. But I love this game. This is definitely the weirdest game I had in my collection. Like I played it because my grandma found it at a yard sale and was like, you like games, you have a Nintendo 64. <laughs> Here's a thing. And I was like, oh, it's weird. a video game and you're a child. Yeah. So I played it, and I'm like, this is the most batshit insane thing I've ever seen in my life. Like, there's no describing it. <laughs> yeah, I have played Legend of the Mystical Ninja for the Super Nintendo. Which is where most people are familiar with it. So I've played that one, and that's it's a funny and weird game. Uh, I remember laughing my way through it, um, just because it was just bonkers. This one's cool. I'm telling you, it's... All the gameplay still holds up. It's still fun. It's still hard. Once you get to the end of some stages, I think at the end of Worlds, you actually get to jump into a giant mech and do this like first person sort of sequence. It's wacky, dude. It's so cool. It looks a lot slicker and fast paced than a lot of Nintendo 64 games. Yeah, it's surprisingly like quick and yeah. it still holds up. I'm telling you, it's it's a solid game visually stylistically gameplay is still sharp and responsive yeah I, th I think they really took advantage of the limitations of the nintendo 64 yeah in their character designs because these still look pretty good that was my one complaint about the n64 which is why i played a lot of playstation i think is there wasn't a whole lot of games that felt like super nintendo titles so there wasn't 2D platformers or some of the sprite heavy games i would have loved to see more sprite games on the n64 on my list the thing I added that I don't think as many people would put on their list is Champions of Norath. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Four player action RPG game on the PlayStation 2. I bought a multi-tap for my PS2 because of this game. I would have my friends over and we would play this game all the time. Is this the one that's in the Forgotten Realms universe or is that another one by the same people? Yes. Yes, it is. Cool. It does take place in the Forgotten Realms. You can create your own character. You have, it's got very similar to kind of a Diablo 2 action RPG kind of feel. With the popularity of Couch Co-op on Diablo 3, I think this would be an amazing game to play on a modern system with updated visuals and all this stuff. And I would give it to Lorian. Yeah, okay. They're already handling Baldur's Gate 3, so they'll be familiar with the lore and the settings. And they've shown they know how to make a good four-player co-op game with Divinity Original Sin 2. And it would give them a chance to try out something a little bit more action-oriented rather than turn-based oriented. And so it would just be kind of cool to see them give a take on it and really bring it into the space and give Diablo 3 some competition on the couch co-op market. I believe this is the game that my buddy Chris and his mom used to play to Bond. It was I think they went through most of these style RPGs, things like Baldur's Gate. Champions of Norath, uh, some of the PC ones too, I think they played. But that's one of the things that they really enjoyed doing was getting together throughout the week and sitting down for some co-op for this. So I, I would love to see this. If not Lorian, Obsidian. Obsidian would be good. They are knocking it out of the park with their RPGs, especially their that kind of isometric time-based action RPG. So it's still turn-based, but you pause it and give commands kind of thing. Meanwhile, Norath is an actual action RPG. You're moving around swinging throwing spells and stuff right but i just remember this game being super fun to play with friends yeah. up to four players it was the only four player game i had on the ps2 there weren't very many and i think this is part of why this game is part of why i love the console experience for diablo 3 so much is just sitting down on the couch next to a friend and just like slaying bad guys with weapons and spells and finding cool loot and i remember we had found a uh, a way to game this system you could create a character we would level them up to like level five or whatever and then save it and then you could start a new game and load another file's character into the new file and so 
we found out later on that you could create a file, save it, then create another file, save a copy of it, and then you could bring in a second player. So you'd, you'd load up your original file, and then you would load in the character again from the second file, and they would both have all the same gear. You unload all of the second character's gear into the first character, and then sell it. Oh, okay. We used to do some similar stuff with uh, Oblivion had a cloning thing that you could easily do. But because of the multiplayer aspect, it made it really easy to do. And glitches kind of like that weren't as common to be found on like a PlayStation game. Yeah. Where you would load another game's character file into the currently loaded file. You don't run into that too often with a, with even any console game. Yeah, it's not very often that takes place. So I'm going to throw a weird one at you to close us out for this, and then we'll run through the end of the episode, because it is getting kind of late. Yeah. So I think this is a bit of a stretch, because not a whole lot of people played or even attempted this game. Final Fantasy VII Dirge of Cerberus is actually kind of enjoyable, mostly because the story is weird, different, and stars Vincent, and some of the cutscenes are freaking cool. But I think that that third-person style action could be absolutely nailed by Digital Extremes, the people who do Warframe. So I, th I think if they were to take a stab at Dirge of Cerberus, that would be epic. So Dirge of Cerberus, I think because they were already kind of close to that style of gameplay, if you were to just take the Warframe engine, slap Final Fantasy VII on it, it'd be freaking cool. <laughs> And like tone that down, get some of their some really talented level designers to really nail some of these areas. Oh, I'd be into it. I'm one of the few people that played Dirge of Cerberus front to back. I remember playing it. I don't think I ever finished it because I was borrowing it from a friend. And it's just like an oddball game in the Final Fantasy. It's weird. I kind of like it though. Like if it were to come out on PC, I'd play it again. <laughs> Near Automata. Near Automata. Okay. Platinum. Yeah. They would also be very good for like a fast paced third person shooter platinum would be good yeah because they also did vanquish all right well yeah sure yeah yeah, yeah. the vanquish people <laughs> right <laughs> comes full uh, circle. and they also did bayonetta <laughs> so they're, yeah, they're, yeah, yeah. they're already kind that of would be in cool. that really fast-paced action shooter space but i also kind of just want to see digital extremes make a game that has a start and a finish so much of warframe is just so big that i can't get into it even though i like just playing it so i don't know there's a cerberus by those folks would be pretty dope the last one I added to the list, I won't dig too much into it because I feel like it's somewhat self-explanatory, is uh, Dragon Age Origins, CD Projekt Red. That makes sense. Just give them another dark fantasy world to just flesh out would be really cool to see. On that note, I think I'd rather see them do Mass Effect. I mean, we're going to see what they're doing with things outside of fantasy here soon with Cyberpunk, but I just... That's true. Plus, I also want Cyber er, CD Projekt Red to take a look at Shadowrun. Oh, I think is a cool universe for them to play around in. That would be cool, but it's it's super close to Cyberpunk. It is, but man, there's some neat little things in there that make and it different And I think CD Projekt really wants to like do different things because they did Dark Fantasy for yeah. so long. So I don't, they would never get Dragon Age Origins, first of all. Maybe they should do a mech game, like a Robotech or something would be cool. Give them a Gundam game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More people need to make Gundam games. Bandai did announce a new Gundam game last week that has 138 characters in it. It's another versus game, so that like two-on-two -two fighting game sort of thing. But uh, yeah, that pretty much sums up our list. So we kind of covered what we've already been playing. I mean, the only other games that I'm spending time with right now are things like System Shock 2 and Scaleboy. Although I did just purchase a couple One Piece games that we played around with briefly, and they're fine. Okay. We just kind of wanted something One Piece, so we picked them up for 10 bucks when they were on sale. But I picked up the Dynasty Warriors clone, Pirate Warriors 3, I think, and then Burning Blood, which is like this weird, weird 3D fighting game that plays like a 2D fighting game, but it's in a 3D arena. It's very strange. It has the worst pacing and just like the weirdest pacing of any fighting game I've ever played. Well, for me, I'm continuing to play Far Cry 5. I'm really having a lot of fun with it. I normally do not like open world games. This is definitely an open world game. But adding in that cooperative element makes it so much fun. Let's do this silly thing together sort of thing. Playing on the playground with your friends as a kid. Playing on a playground by yourself as a kid, not as much fun as with your friends. That's my comparison. I know a lot of people love open world yeah. games. Just not my thing. Far Cry 5 has been a huge exception because in a lot of open world games, I kind of just end up sticking to the story, do some side questing stuff, and then... I either burn out or just finish the story, and then that's it. We have spent so much time goofing around in Far Cry 5, which is kind of funny uh, in a sense that the story is actually very intense and very serious. And then five minutes after watching a cutscene where someone gets a tattoo of a sin on them, cut off of their body, and then stapled to a wall, 
I'm standing on an airplane going, hey, see if you can fly this while I stand on top of it. (laughs) (laughs) So there's some really, there's some, there's some disconnect to the hijinks and the story. Lunar narrative dissonance. (laughs) Yeah, where you're kind of forgetting that you're in the middle of a really intense story. And then I'm, lastly, I'm just kind of continuing through Final Fantasy X still. Still enjoying it. I don't like that one, but you do you. I'd still like to play through it, I guess, one of these days. I almost bought Final Fantasy XII on Switch because there's a sale going on right now on Target for buy one, get one. Or buy two, get one. For a long time, that was my favorite Final Fantasy game, and then I played 9. Yeah, I really like 12, but it gets kind of, like, really challenging towards about halfway through. To the point that I just don't find it fun anymore. I love that game, start to finish. I used a Game Shark to beat that one ghost boss, because he was just that tough. (laughs) But Joe, if somebody wanted to find your stuff on the internet, where might they look? Well, anything pretty much Daddy Gamer related, at the Daddy Gamer on Twitter... Daddy Gamer YT on Twitch and Daddy Gamer Reviews on YouTube are the best ways to find me. There's a Facebook somewhere. I think it's the same as the Twitter. If you wanted to talk to me specifically, you can check out at the number four Forever Classic 105 on Twitter. I'm on there pretty constantly, just kind of dicking around. Uh, if you want to just hang out with us in Forever Classic, the best way to keep attached is foreverclassicgames.com. We have a lot of our podcast episode links there. There's a podcast player, there's news, there's reviews, we've got features, links to all our various social channels, so definitely check that out. And the main social area that I think people are having the most fun with is our Discord, and that link is available in the show notes. Every episode has it, just look it up, you will find it, I promise. Other than that, I did just make a Byte account for Forever Classic Games, so if you look up Forever Classic Games on Byte, it is a new Vine. I made two or three little short videos that just for fun to see if anybody would even react to them, so that's there. I claimed our account. We have a Byte now, I guess. Who knows if it'll turn into anything, but we have it. <laughs> Another week of games is knocking on our door, so until next time, everybody, stay cool. Thank you so much for listening to the Forever Classic Podcast. Share us with a friend, and just be good to each other. <laughs> <laughs>